Last week, we brought you part one of the story of two 14-year-old girls who vanished in Roanoke, Virginia in 1977. Angela Rader and Tammy Akers were best friends who hung out together, getting into low-level teenage trouble like skipping school and shoplifting. But they were sweet girls with families who loved them. Despite this, when they disappeared, both police and their families initially wrote them off as runaways. You see, the pair had run off together before, but had always returned quickly. Except this time they didn't. In fact, it would be years before police even thought something bad had happened to the girls or had a person of interest in this case. But when they did, the families were shocked to find out how close they had been to him all these years. When a person goes missing, there's a special kind of pain in the not knowing. I want to tell the stories of those who never came home. I want to tell you the story of Angela Rader and Tammy Akers. I'm Kona Gallagher. And I'm Ethan Flick. And this is, and then they were gone. the second two-parter that we've done, but this case took so many twists and turns over the years, uh, over 44 years. Yeah, 44 years. I was just going to say, so this is the the oldest case. Yeah, by far. Um, So we just couldn't fit everything into one episode, Um, but there is a ton of important information that we did cover in that first episode. So if you haven't listened yet, definitely go back and do that before you start this one. But just to give a little recap for those of you who maybe listened to the first one a little while ago, Angela Rader and Tammy Akers met at Coiner Springs Juvenile Center, but realized that they actually went to the same middle school in Roanoke, so they exchanged info and became fast friends. By this time, Tammy had been hanging around and working at a place by her house called The Shop, which was owned by a man named Earl Bramblett. Earl loved hanging out with kids and teenagers and wasn't super into adults. Kind of red flag. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Tammy's older sister, Linda Owens, says that she had repeatedly been molested by Earl when she was younger and suspected that he was doing the same to Tammy. However, both Tammy and Earl denied it, with Earl swearing that he only loved Tammy like a daughter. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right, so when we left off last week, it's 1994, and the girls have been missing for nearly 20 years. Earl is now divorced and staying with the Hodges family in Vinton, which is just outside of Roanoke. On August 29th, 1994, the Hodges' home went up in flames, killing the entire family. But the fire wasn't the cause of their deaths. And after determining that it wasn't a murder-suicide as they initially thought, police bring in Earl Bramblett for questioning. When police brought him in, they mentioned that the Hodge family died in a fire. Earl reportedly told police, quote, son of a bitch offed his family and killed himself, end quote. Maybe that's what led to their initial investigation or their initial finding that no, so they... Uh, or is this a, after they spent five minutes looking at the scene? <laughs> this was after realizing that. that. And that's why the they were interviewing him in the first place. The problem with Earl's statement is that police hadn't mentioned anything about the gun or any other violence toward the uh, family. He, they only told him that they died in a house fire. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. So at this point, Earl is rocketing up to the top of their suspect list. As the investigation continues, Earl's sister gives police a box of stuff that Earl had left with her. For some unknown reason, he had recorded several audio tapes detailing his sexual attraction to 11-year-old Willow, the Hodge's daughter, and how he believed that the Hodge family was going to set him up for child molestation. Like, to what end, I'm not exactly sure. Like, I don't 
what would the benefit, like why would a family set up an innocent person and accuse him of molesting their 11 year old daughter? And he's saying this after he admits to being sexually attracted to her. Yeah. Yeah. Apparently, apparently it's all in like the same audio tapes in a box that he left with his sister for some reason. I guess maybe he thought the police wouldn't look there. I guess. But his sister's like, oh, yeah, by the way, here's this box of crap that my brother left me. Yeah. Take a look at it. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't I don't know. Or maybe she listened to it and was like, um, no, thank you. Yeah, probably. Yeah. More and more evidence against Bramblett started emerging, including the fact that he clocked into work 20 minutes after the fire was started. Coincidentally, he worked 20 minutes away from the mm-hmm. Hodges house. And then he tried to black this out on his time card, like presumably when he realized he screwed up. Mm. Um, And then they also found a pair of jeans soaking in a sink at his workplace that were determined to have been covered in the same flammable liquid that had been used to set the Hodge house on fire. They also found um, bullets that were like the same make it, you know, as the bullets, yeah, the same caliber, like the same brand, you know, everything, Mm -hmm. um, in one of Bramblett's cars. So not the smartest criminal. It it doesn't appear so, no, but regardless, he maintained his innocence and, you know, so that he had nothing to do with the fire, the murders or anything else, but he was arrested and went to trial in 1997 Linda Owens, along with one other woman, testified at the trial that Earl had given them alcohol and molested them as teenagers. So in what's interesting, in one article that I read, uh, it said that, you know, they allowed two women, one of who I know now know is Linda, to testify and then that there were more, mm-hmm. but the judge stopped it after two and was like, no, that's enough. Obviously, they were brought in for character witnesses. Right, because, um, yeah, that had nothing to do with... With the actual murder. Right, 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 right. It just had more to do with the fact that, you know, he more than likely was molesting the daughter. Yeah, uh, and so <laughs> the, the legal system at this point, since the this testimony wouldn't be in conjunction with bringing up additional charges, uh, I'm sure that the judge was probably like, okay, we get it. More than likely, the defense stipulated to what the further testimony would be from other witnesses. Right. And just say, okay, we get it. He's a child molester. Let's move on. Which is fucked up to say. It is, but but being a child molester doesn't mean that you murdered a family of four. Correct, and that's what he was on trial for, was murder, not not child molestation. No, you're exactly right. And either way... Um, you know, it didn't, it, it ended up not mattering because the jury deliberated for one hour and found him guilty and sentenced him to death. Once Earl was in prison, police took a renewed interest in him and his possible relation to Tammy and Angela's disappearances. But not only did Earl continue to deny any involvement, he also offered up an alternate theory. (laughs) Okay, let's hear it. (laughs) Is is this also going to involve a gun magically uh, being used and then taken apart by Uh, by the person (laughs) that's dead? No, but it's almost as good. According to Earl Bramblett, Tammy died in a bonfire in Florida. (laughs) What? Yeah. In a letter written to the Roanoke Times in 1998, he said, quote, And in my crying and my beer sadness, I accepted blame for Tammy's fate because I had never done anything to steer her in a better direction. And I will again express my opinion that Tammy Akers died in a bonfire in central Florida around 1980, and the police are aware of this and have withheld it from the public. Oh, so now he's now he's saying that the that there's a conspiracy behind it, too. So a multi-jurisdictional yes, conspiracy. Right. So his opinion, as he mm-hmm. said, uh, is that she died in a bonfire in Florida while he was still in Virginia. Yes. Like, how would he know that? So that is so interesting to me because, like, so I read this blog. Um, it's called Whereabouts Unknown. And she made the connection to like what the hell Earl was even talking about at this point. But like even reading what she said, which I'll get into, I still can't even figure out how he would have 
heard about this and like how he even would have known about it. Yeah. But anyway, so what this refers to, what Earl is referring to is in 1979, a woman was murdered in Pasco County, Florida. Her partially nude burned corpse was found in a game preserve about 60 miles outside of Tampa. The medical examiner later said that she had been struck in the head twice with a heavy object, but that the burns were the cause of her death. And she was burned over like 80% of her body. Okay. Police investigated and found that a large party had taken place on the game preserve. And they just started to question people who attended. You know, they're trying to not only find out the perpetrator, but also find out who the, the, victim, the victim was. Yeah, because yeah, they had no idea. She was, like I said, partially nude, burns over 80% of her body. They had no idea. Some women who attended the party say that they had met the woman that night and thought that her name was Tammy. Do, do we have an estimate on age from any of these witnesses? Because at this point, Tammy would have been 16. You said 79? Yeah. Yeah, you're exactly right. Tammy would have been 16, and um, not from the witnesses, but the, um, the authorities said that the Jane Doe was approximately like in her early to mid 20s. But again, okay. that that's yeah, that doesn't necessarily rule Tammy out in, in my estimation. Although Tammy did look very young for her age, but again. Four years, that's not that big of a, a no, stretch, and that's, especially when you're dealing with a burn victim. Like, I mean, right. yeah. really. And, th- and that's typically the age range that when you're describing somebody, you, you give about five years, yeah, five yeah. to 10 years. I mean, this woman on, wasn't like 50, right. you know? Yes. I mean, it wasn't something that was completely out of the question. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so that, sure. Mm-hmm. However, you know, they also described the woman as 5'6", Tammy was 5'4". But again, it was two years later. She could have grown two inches. Yeah. The woman was also uh, said to be around 120 pounds. Tammy was about 87 pounds when she disappeared. But again, a lot can happen in two years. Yeah, especially at that age. Yeah. So yeah. it's like it, it it could have been her. Like, absolutely. And the fact that they said Tammy, like... I get why anybody who would have heard about this, although I still don't know how anybody heard about this down in Pasco County, Florida, like up to Roanoke. I mean, it's the late 90s. So I guess like the internet is a thing, but I don't know. Yeah, but this happened in 79. Yes, but yes, but it's in the late 90s that Earl is saying. Oh, I see. That this. I mean, yeah. Okay. So he. So maybe he found the story on the internet and his he's presenting it as an alternate theory, obviously, yeah. to take blame off of himself. But, I mean, if the only thing that's linking it is the name Tammy, I mean, there's probably other people named Tammy that yeah. are between 16 and 21 that are 5'6 and 120 20 pounds. pounds. Yeah. I mean... Well, and what's really interesting to me is that by this point in 1998, where he's like writing this letter to the paper, the the woman had been identified. Oh, so, well. yeah, it, it's really interesting. Um, it was actually because of a Washington Post reporter named Athelia Knight. During the initial investigation, you know, in 1979, 1980, um, two half brothers, William Riley Gent and Ernest Lee Miller, were convicted of the at the time Jane Doe's murder, and they were sentenced to death. Right, so they were on death row. This woman was still unidentified. People are like, "Oh, I think her name's Tammy. We just met her this night. Like that night, we don't know who she is." But Athelia Knight started digging into it and digging into the brother's conviction. And she actually managed to tie the unidentified murder victim to a missing woman from Tennessee named Gail Bradshaw. Hmm. Bradshaw's relatives had actually visited the Pasco County Sheriff's Department back in 1979 because they heard about the murder and believed that the victim could have been Gail. Because Gail had just moved to the area with her boyfriend, Bobby Dodd, just a few weeks before she disappeared. 
Eventually, Knight was able to facilitate the Bradshaw family getting fingerprints off of an old photo album that belonged to Gail, and they tested them against the Jane Doe. And so because of those fingerprints, she was positively ID'd as Gail Bradshaw. Well, it sounds to me like Earl didn't do that much digging into his research. Like I said, she had by, been identified, but but he and I and some other people, to be fair, were still raising questions like, oh, I mean, these are just fingerprints off of an old photo album. Is it really her? This could still be Tammy. You know. Sure. Yeah, but But. police were like, um, what are the odds of a random family in Tennessee having fingerprints on a photo album of... Of Tammy. Yeah, right? Like, Yeah. Yeah, so they're like, no, it's Gail. The identification, you know, subsequently led to a whole house of cards coming down around this conviction. Like, people recanted statements. Somebody else came forward and said that they saw the boyfriend murder Gail. You know, this whole, like, it just became a whole thing. And 16 hours before the brothers were supposed to be executed, they got a reprieve, though they were not cleared. And I don't you know, want to get into a whole rabbit hole like sure, with this with case. This, you know. But you can read Athelia Knight's article on our blog, and there's a second article as well. And it's very interesting. But at the end of the day, it doesn't have anything to do with Tammy Akers or Angela Rader. Or the multi-jurisdictional conspiracy. Right. <laughs> on hiding a body for, or the identity of a body for no reason. For some, yeah, for some reason. I don't know. Despite Earl's insistence that Tammy died in Florida and he had nothing to do with it, eight months after he went to prison for the Hodges murders, police visited the home that he had built in Bedford the same one where he had shot up the walls in 1980 Mm -hmm. to see if they could find any clues in Tammy and Angela's disappearance. You said Bedford. Yeah. So it's, it's right outside of Roanoke. Like it's yeah. Just another small town. I think we've actually been there before. Yeah. If I recall, they have some sort of a train museum. I feel like there's something with trains in Bedford. Uh, (laughs) I don't know if I'm wrong about that Bedford residence. I apologize. But in any case, at this time in 94, um, Earl obviously didn't own the house anymore. Nobody associated with him owned the house anymore. Um, So police went to the home with cadaver dogs and ground penetrating radar and started to dig. Mm -hmm. But they found nothing, like no trace of either girl and no trace of foul play of any kind. But the issue of this house isn't as cut and dry as it may seem. Okay. Once Earl was arrested for murdering this family, the two families, the Raider family and the Akers family, became more convinced than ever that he had something to do with the girls' disappearances. Tammy's brother, Pat, started investigating on his own. At one point, and as a licensed realtor in good standing in the state of Virginia, I have to say that I absolutely do not condone this. Oh, boy. But it's... Mary, Earl's ex-wife, apparently put her house up for sale, and Pat posed as a potential buyer just so he could get in and look around. Oh, boy. Yeah. And this wasn't even the same house that they lived in in 1977. This wasn't the Bedford house that I was talking about. This was just like some other house that Mary lived in. And Mary and Earl had divorced shortly after the girls disappeared. So, like, she hadn't even been his wife in decades at that point. Um, But, you know, I guess he was just kind of looking for any connection that he could find. Mm -hmm. So obviously he didn't find anything, Um, but he didn't stop there. He actually did end up at the Bedford house and whomever was living there at the time gave him permission to come in and take a look inside. But the basement had changed since the seventies. What was once a standard open basement was now separated by a rock wall. Linda Owens, Tammy's sister, remembers that Earl's plan was to put the washer and dryer in an unfinished back portion of the basement and then use the rest, like the front portion, as a finished recreation room. But the entire space was open. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's like they would just, just partially finish the basement, have a rec room, and then just throw the washer and dryer in the back. Right. But in 1994, when Pat went there, 
And when police went there, the back area was walled off, and the only access to it was through a panel in the floor of the master bedroom closet that was apparently originally supposed to function as a laundry chute. This really is turning into a Stephen King novel. (laughs) So what's really creepy is I've actually shown a house like this, um, like here in Lovettsville, um, or in Percival, one of the two. That somewhere had, in Western that had a murder shoot? No, it it had a hatch in the floor of the master bedroom closet that led to like a dirt crawl space. Creepy. It was terrifying. Like it was so scary. I, I've run into a few things that like really freaked me out and that was definitely one of them. Yeah, so anyway, so this same thing panel in the floor of the master bedroom, but like this one was really tiny. So the one that I saw, I don't know how big it was, but like it was big enough that like a standard person could easily climb down and go through. Like it was, Mm -hmm. I don't know, two feet by two feet, three feet by three feet. I don't know what it is, but it, it, it was a reasonable size for somebody to access it. This wasn't, um, it was very tiny because again, it was like supposed to be a laundry chute. So right. it wasn't supposed to be huge, but Pat was a skinny guy. So he was able to like fit down there. Mm. And so he checked out the back part of the basement. And what was weird about this, like besides literally everything <laughs> was that the water pump was back there on that side of the basement, virtually inaccessible except by like tiny people without claustrophobia. Mm-hmm he couldn't think of any reasonable reason like why that would have been placed there. You know, there wasn't any reason why somebody would have just walled off the basement and put the water pump behind it only accessible through this like teeny tiny hatch. Right. Yeah. Interestingly on a web sleuths forum about this case, a woman who claims to have lived in that house with her parents when police came to investigate corroborated Pat's description of the basement. She says, and I'm just going to like read the whole thing. Quote, the basement was entered through a set of stone steps on the outside of the house by the time I came around, but this wasn't always the case. In the middle of the basement, a cement wall was constructed, cutting off a majority of this basement, which is presumably backfilled. Some distance behind this wall, in a section that used to be basement, is a small room accessible only by a hidden hatch in the master bedroom closet. Cadaver dogs searched all of these areas, but the soil beneath couldn't be searched without demolishing the house first. This wasn't just a cinder block wall. We're talking cast concrete. When I asked about this wall, I was told basically there wasn't a reason for your plumbing to be accessible through your master bedroom as opposed to the existing basement laundry room. These modifications were done in the same time frame of these young girls going missing. The room literally had two long coffin-sized slabs on either side, and the floor was closer to the ceiling in this room, end quote. The floor was closer to the ceiling? Yeah, so it was like there were two like coffin-sized slabs labs like, like elevations in the room yeah it sounds like it behind this walled off area okay so so whoever this is writing the blog got down there too yeah so this is the little girl who like lived in the house at the time yeah so she had presumably seen it and then like i guess you know as she got older because she was little at the time so i guess as she got older had asked you know her parents about like what yeah. <laughs> was happening yeah yeah so what did the brother find? Did he find the same thing? Yeah. So Linda didn't mention the slabs um, in her description of what Pat saw. And Pat um, had passed away by the time that she wrote this. Okay. Um, he actually died at the age of 39 from, I believe, kidney disease. Mm. So yeah. So I don't know. But the little girl who lives there said that there were two coffin-sized slabs and that there was no reason for this to be walled off and it made zero sense. Creepy. Mm -hmm. So it does seem as though the girls could possibly be in that basement. But while this is insanely creepy, uh, remember that the police didn't find anything when they searched. 
So after that, you know, the case went cold. Police still suspected Earl, but they still had zero solid evidence pointing toward him. Right. Or pointing that a crime even occurred in the first place. Right. Which is why these missing persons cases are so hard. He continued to say that he had nothing to do with Tammy and Angela's disappearances, nor did he have anything to do with the Hodge murders. Helen Akers, Tammy's mother, tried to visit him in prison, but he refused to see her, and his secrets died with him. Earl Bramblett was put to death by the state in 2003. Which means, unfortunately, this case is probably never going to be solved. Maybe, but maybe not. All right, so 2003, Earl dies. And with Earl gone, the chances of finding the girls certainly diminished. But it didn't go down to zero. New theories and evidence have continued to emerge, and one possibility involves a notorious serial killer. So do you know the name Rodney Alcala? No. Okay. He's known as the dating game killer. Okay. You haven't heard of that either? No. Okay. Well, he's a serial killer, as you probably guessed. And he got that name because he actually appeared on an episode of the dating game. Oh, really? Yeah. Did he kill the the date? No, no. And that's like actually one of the most interesting parts about that aspect of him is that the woman who won the date with him like never went on it because she immediately was creeped out by him. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) And it's really interesting because if you watch the clip online, it's like on YouTube, uh, you can see them at the end and they're like, oh, you're going to go to Chili's or whatever like the 1975 equivalent (laughs) is. And she's just standing there like, okay. (laughs) Yeah, so anyway, his thing was that he would tempt women with modeling sessions. So he would meet them in bars and say that he was a photographer and offer to like take photos of them that they could use to launch a modeling career. And then he would lure them into like the desert or someplace isolated. He was in Southern California Mm -hmm. and take photos, and then often kill them. Police have an entire stash of photos of women that Alcala took over the years. Some are of his known victims. Others were victims that hadn't been tied to him, and still others are unidentified. What's interesting is that when police started publicizing these photos several years ago, some of the subjects came forward and identified themselves, So for some of these women, like, he really did just take their photos. Mm -hmm. So some of these women came forward or, like, had family members who saw these pictures online and said, like, wait, that's Aunt Marcia, and she's fine and living in Connecticut. (laughs) Like, it's so interesting to me. So police still have this, like, huge stack of photos, and they don't know if they're victims. They don't know if they're just, like, random ladies. Mm -hmm. They don't know. So they're really, they've been trying for years to fully identify them. And this comes into play here because one of the photos that was found, people say bears a strong resemblance to Angela Rader. And all right, of the two of us, you're the face expert. Like, I'm basically one step above just total facial blindness. (laughs) Like everyone looks the same to me. Sure. Um, so I want to get your opinion on this. And for those of you who are listening, like I'm going to put these two photos on our website so you can judge for yourself. Okay. So this is a picture of Angela Rader. And this is the photo that is on all like the missing posters and everything. Okay. So can you kind of describe what she looks like? White woman. I mean, it's black and white photo, so I don't mm-hmm. know the color of her hair, but it's dark. She's got a dimple on her left cheek doesn't look like she's got the greatest teeth short hair dark i I don't know you can't really tell if the eyes are light or dark they they were blue so like they were light eyes okay yeah you know i didn't even notice the dimple that's interesting but like high cheekbones i would say kind of a pointy chin a little bit yeah it's rounded but no dimple in the chin Mm -hmm. and this is the photo that alcala took Okay. Um, no, <laughs> it's not. It's not the same person. Uh, different nose. She doesn't have a a dimple on her cheek, cheek. Uh, when she smiles. Uh, but I don't know. I mean, is she she's not really smiling in this picture, though. She's kind of giving like a sultry 
model y look. She has a smirk and yeah. there's no dimple there. It looks like this woman also has dark eyes. And this is a color photo, yeah. we should mention. Right. Yeah. Sorry. Take me back to the other one. She is also he- she also has a, a freckle or a mole on her neck that is not there in the black and white photo of Angela. Oh. It's a different nose, too. The nose shape is different. So you see that there's a uh, a mole right there on her neck? Oh, yeah. You can see it. It's at the, uh, so the Akala photo, it's like almost cut off. It's at the very, very bottom of the photo. Right. It's not there. That could be a little bit higher, though. So they're both very tightly framed kind of headshots. And... Yeah, the I'll, one of I'll Angela you, just might be framed a little bit tighter. I'll give you that, and also, you know, moles and freckles do appear as you get older, mm-hmm. so that is a good possibility. It's the nose. Yeah, it's a totally different nose. Angela's nose bridge is wider, mm. and the nose kind of uh, dips down a little bit further at at the point mm-hmm. than this Ocala photo. The nose bridge is very narrow, and she has a kind of a a slight upward appearance to the tip of the nose. Yeah. See, and that's why I wanted you to look at this. I mean, now that you said that and I look at the noses, they do look very different. But like when I first looked, I'm like, I don't know. They're white ladies (laughs) with brown hair. They're probably the same person. (laughs) Like I have no idea. Yeah. I don't, I don't see it to me. To me, there there's, there are too many differences. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. In theory, I suppose she could have had plastic surgery because we don't know the age of the person in the photo but uh, it, there's there's too much they're too different yeah for, yeah for me to say that they're the same person yeah so like i said you guys can look at our website and um see what you think but i, I mean even though i didn't notice a lot of those details i mean i tend to agree like i i wasn't i didn't find this incredibly compelling when i saw the two photos also was there any evidence that he had been in uh virginia no, that's the other Southern thing. California. Not at all. So there, Southern California isn't the only place that he was. It was his primary location. Um, I think he did commit crimes in the Northeast as well, but nothing Pointing in the into South. Virginia. No, or anywhere near Virginia. Does he have a blue car? <laughs> Not that I know of. Okay. So while I wouldn't necessarily classify like that as a lead... Something big did happen in this case just last year. In July of 2020, almost 40 years to the day after Gina Renee Hall disappeared from Blacksburg, Virginia, some of her DNA and remains were found scattered around the New River Valley. Gina was a freshman at Radford University when she disappeared and was in Blacksburg, which is the home of Virginia Tech. After a night out, she left with Stephen Epperly, who was a former Tech football player. Epperly was eventually convicted of Gina's murder, despite it being a no-body case. But he refused to say where Gina was. So last year, Gina's sister, Diana Hall Bodmer, connected with Dr. Arpad Voss, a forensic anthropologist out of Tennessee. In 2018, Voss patented a device called the Inquisitor. He claims that this device detects DNA buried beneath the surface. According to a report by WDBJ, Dr. Voss and Diana Hall ended up finding traces of Gina's DNA in eight different locations, and they even found part of one of her bones in a place where Epperly used to hunt. Hmm. Crazy stuff. I mean, 40 years after she disappeared, they find her DNA in eight separate locations. It's not like it's some magic thing. Like they weren't just randomly finding it in locations. They were searching in places that they had been tipped about from people with knowledge of the crime. So they said, Hey, you should probably look in these areas. So they did. They took the machine. They apparently found her DNA and then part of her bone. Hmm. So what does this have to do with Angela and Tammy? During this search, Gina Hall's DNA isn't the only DNA that they found. They also found traces of Angela's DNA. Oh. Gina's sister told WDBJ, quote, do we have proof? 
No, but we have an instrument that we put in a sample of Angela from her family, and we find her on a ridge near the same valley, and we find her in a different location that we are currently investigating, and we find her at the creek. That tells me we've got more victims, and we've only checked Gina and Angela's, end quote. So who is this guy again? He is um, a doctor. He's a forensic anthropologist. No, not Foss. The, oh. the oh, Stephen Epperly. So he was a um, former Virginia Tech football player who basically, you know, was just like another kid along with Gina, and they left a club or a bar or whatever, and uh, he ended up murdering Gina. So what would be the connection to Angela and um... Stephen? They're not saying that there is one between Angela and any of the people. All they're saying is that location-wise, because this is all in the same geographical area. Okay. So all they're saying is that when they were looking for Gina Hall, they also found Angela's DNA. They're not saying that the two cases are connected. Okay. Just that geographically. Yeah, I'm I'm not... I know I've been there a bunch of times Mm -hmm. uh, to that area, but I'm not super familiar with Roanoke versus Virginia Tech. Yeah, it's all like within an hour of each other. Okay. Yeah, it's all like very close by. It's all down 81. Yeah, well, no, I knew that. I Mm -hmm. mean, because like I said, we've been there, but I've never never specifically gone to Roanoke and then from Roanoke to – Blacksburg. Right, right. So. And and yeah, so it's it's really it's all like I said, the same area and you know, they did go to eight different kind of places and and so yeah, so somewhere in there they apparently found Angela's DNA. That's interesting. I wonder what the science is behind that machine, how it collects the samples. You're not the only one who's a little curious about this. There's a blog called Defrosting Cold Cases. And that links to a bunch of reports that actually question the The efficacy of the Inquisitor and mention several cases in which it was used but produced no results. And and I had actually, as I was reading this, I realized that I had heard of this guy and heard of this machine before because there's another great podcast called Murder on the Space Coast. And one of their seasons, they go into the, I'll say the murder of Brandy Hall, even though similarly her body's also never been found. But they brought in Dr. Voss um, and the Inquisitor to try to find her DNA. Brandy Hall is down in Florida, and they didn't find anything. But apparently, they've also used him and this device um, in the search for Maura Murray, who is another very well-known right. missing yeah. person. Yeah. Has anybody brought up to Dr. Voss and anything that you read about him not naming the device after something that would be a that a bad guy in Batman would use. <laughs> like why why would you name why would you name your device the Inquisitor? Yeah, and it's in all caps too. Oh boy. Yeah, so it's like I mean maybe it stands for something, but I don't know. Uh, I mean that would be a long acronym. Well, My yeah. God, <laughs> it'd be a whole paragraph. Yeah, I don't know. Um, but you know the point that they made on that blog, the defrosting cold cases blog, is that there are a lot of cases in which it hasn't turned up anything and so she's a little concerned like that this is actually real basically that they actually did find her dna that this bone actually is gina's and not just like a random animal bone that they somehow thought belonged to her so her thing is like i hope they're also investigating this in an independent lab and you know we're getting kind of the whole thing double checked yeah um and you know, because this is so recent, I have no idea, you know, what's going on with this and you know, what they are doing. But Diane, Gina Hall's older sister, plans on continuing to work with Dr. Voss and excavate all of the eight sites that they identified with the goal of hopefully putting not only her sister's mystery to rest, but that of Angela and maybe even Tammy as well. Mm-hmm. While there are, I think, legitimate questions about this machine and its efficacy, like it definitely, with a case that's 44 years old, absolutely seems like a road worth traveling down. Uh, yeah. I mean, where else are you going to go? It, I, I mean, at that, yeah. at this point, a- any new leads are worth checking out. Yeah. Yeah. Over the past 44 years, the Raider and the Acres families have continued to search for their missing members. 
They've held vigils and worked with law enforcement. The Raider family has done a lot of work with an organization called Help Save the Next Girl. Today, the families are trying to get police to keep pushing to find Tammy and Angela. A few months ago, Angela's sister, Barbara, who runs the Help Find Angela Raider Facebook page, said, quote, I have credible evidence of where my sister Angela is buried. Can't get police cooperation to prove it, end quote. And I'm assuming this is referencing Earl's former home, the one that police searched in 1994, um, you know, but she doesn't specify. Mm -hmm. But again, like in that house really does bug me because I apparently they couldn't dig or do anything more without risking the actual structure of the house. Yeah. And so unsurprisingly, the people who owned it at the time were like, no, thank you. Like, please don't demolish my house. Sure. Don't demolish my house. But like, if it were my house, like, I don't know. I would want to know if I, if there were two dead bodies in my, in yeah, my in basement. My, yeah, I know. I like, I just, it I would seems exhaust like every option. Yeah. And like, yes, I wouldn't want to lose my home, but I just, I feel like there has to be something that everybody could kind of figure out. Right. Yeah. To like start busting the concrete floor open and just see what's under there. Yeah. You know, I, I, and I don't know. I, I just, I don't know. Yeah. We don't, you're right. We don't know. We don't know what, what those structures are, if they're somehow tied into the foundation of the house and maybe that's why they can't. Yeah. Well, and that's what that, that woman who used to live there says that like you literally like couldn't do any more than they did without damaging the house itself. Yeah, so I don't know. I don't know who lives there now. She doesn't live there anymore, mm -hmm. so presumably somebody else does. But I was never able to find anything that indicated that police or anyone else searched it after that time in 1994. Oh, so maybe they don't actually know about those slabs, or maybe... No, so I think they, they probably do, but like they couldn't... They couldn't get into it, and I don't think that it's been revisited, mm. is my point. And so I don't know who's living there now. I, I mean, for all we know, nobody's living there now. Mm -hmm. And it could be something that they could explore now in 2021, whereas they couldn't in 1994. Like, I have no idea. Yeah. And so the two families, the Raider family and the Akers family, are obviously still very active. You know, they want answers. And... 44 years is just too long to go without those answers. The girl's parents have passed away. Like I mentioned before, Tammy's brother passed away. Mm -hmm. I mean, these people are leaving us and they need to find their lost sisters. And it drives me crazy that, you know, eight weeks ago is when Angela's sister made that comment about not getting police cooperation we shouldn't be in a situation 44 years later where police cooperation is a stumbling block. It's one thing in 1977 when they're like, oh, these two girls just ran away, whatever. But it's been 44 years. They've had a person of interest since 1980. They, you know, this person has been pretty much proven to have molested several children this person was convicted of murdering four people, including two children. You know, his alternate theory is nonsense. Like, right. we should be at a point where the police understand, like, okay, something happened here. We really need to dedicate everything we can possibly dedicate to getting this resolved. Yeah. These weren't throwaway girls. These weren't just like two girls that nobody cared about. You know, people care about them. People are still writing about them 44 years later. Like their sister, you know, talks about them all the time. They deserve answers. So I just hope that by getting their stories out there, we're just adding two more voices. Right to this push that will hopefully get police to move forward as much as possible. Angela May Rader and Tammy Lynn Akers have been missing from Roanoke, Virginia since February 7th, 1977. Both girls were 14 years old. 
Angela was five feet tall and 100 pounds. She had brown hair and blue eyes. Her left eye protrudes. Tammy was five foot four and 82 pounds. She had red hair and blue eyes. She had scarred earlobes, a black mark on her cheek, and a protruding belly button. They would both be 58 years old today. If you have any information about the girl's disappearance, please contact the Roanoke City Police Department at 540-853-5305. You can see all of the sources for this episode along with photos and videos at our website, and then they were gone.com. And be sure to follow us on social, and then they were gone pod on Facebook and at ATTWG pod on Instagram and Twitter. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe and consider leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. It will help new listeners find us. And the more people that listen, the more chances we have of bringing someone home. And we want to hear from you. You can also leave us a message at the address on our show notes, and we may play it on a future episode. And we'll see you here next week for a brand new episode. See you next week. And Then They Were Gone is hosted by Kona Gallagher and Ethan Flick. All research, writing, and editing is done by Kona Gallagher. Theme music is The Stork by Ketza. Additional music is provided by Kai Engel. And Then They Were Gone is a Little Monster production.